Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. The text for our meditation this morning comes from Romans chapter 5. We read the first 11 verses. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So far, God's holy word. One of the things that almost everyone is taught while they're growing up, or that you're supposed to learn anyways, is not to brag so much. You're supposed to be humble. Because experience teaches us that there's no such thing as a sure thing. And if you brag enough, at some point you're probably going to be humbled. I remember when I was younger, in grade school, I felt this compulsive need to brag about my favorite sports teams. And I was a Green Bay Packers fan, and I had friends who were Vikings fans, and And I would brag on Friday about how much better the Packers were and how they would beat the Vikings on Sunday. And if the Vikings ever won, oh, it was mortifying. I did not want to go back into school on Monday and have to face the music. See, it's experiences like this that teach us to be humble, to be more general about things, to say, well, I don't know if we're going to win. I hope we're going to win, but I'm not sure. Yeah, somewhere along the way, you're taught that it's better to be humble, not to brag. And if you're not taught that, you'll at least pick it up somewhere along the line. Now, growing up and maturing in our faith is actually exactly the opposite. Paul tells us in our text that we should boast. Now, if you're scanning through the text, you won't find the word boast in there. But actually, anytime you run into the word rejoice in this text, it comes from this one Greek word, and a better translation of that word is boast, to brag about it. So verse 2, for instance, it says we are to rejoice in hope. He's literally saying brag in your hope. Verse 3, rejoice in sufferings. He says you should be boasting because of your suffering. Not many of the writers of the Bible use this particular word, but Paul uses it all over the place in all of his epistles. And anytime he's telling us to boast, it's always about the same thing. He says, boast in Jesus Christ. And then he points to the last day and he says, we can boast because of Jesus Christ. We know what's going to happen. There's only two things that will happen on the last day, and they're both pointed out in this text. Verse 2, the first option is, he says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The other option is found in verse 9. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. On the last day, there's only two options. Either you will receive God's glory or you will receive God's wrath. That's the only way this will go. And Paul tells us, We can be 100% sure which of these options are awaiting us. He says, we boast in hope of the glory of God. We can brag about that. 
We can boast about that. We can speak openly about that to other people. And we don't have to be worried that it's not going to turn out that way. We don't have to be concerned that we're going to be ashamed or humbled because it turns out differently than we expected. No, rather, we can be confident in this fact. And Paul uses two things to make us more confident. Paul points to two things that God uses to make us more confident in this. God tells us that we can brag, A, because we have peace with God, and B, because we have suffered. Now, of those two statements, obviously the second one is a little more confusing. Boasting because of our suffering? That doesn't sound quite right to us. We're going to save that for later. We'll focus on the first one first. And actually, boasting in this piece, that's also a really strange idea as well. Now, it's not strange to boast when you're at peace. After all, that's when we do it generally. When your team is doing really well and has been on a long winning streak, that's when you brag. When your country is really strong and powerful and at peace, that's when you boast. You wouldn't have it, or you wouldn't be boasting any other time. Now, it's times like that when, we, when everything is going really well and we do start to feel a little bit indestructible that when we start boasting, that can lead to a great deal of arrogance. This is likely how the country of France felt in the early 20th century. In the early 1900s, France had what many considered to be the greatest army on the face of the earth. Actually, during, during World War I, they had about 2 million soldiers in their army. Just a vast army. Not only did they have all this military strength, they were also the world's epicenter of art, of culture, of philosophy. They were on top at the time. In France, no one thought anyone was going to be attacking them anytime soon. They would be crazy to do so. And really, this type of mentality in France, it kind of took over the whole world. Where mankind in general thought, We've reached such a height of philosophy and wisdom. There's no way we're going to have fighting anymore. We're past all that. That's why World War I was known as the war to end all wars. And yet, the 20th century went on to be the bloodiest century in the history of this earth. In France, during the next decade or so, invaded shelled three times, captured twice by the German armies? Where was all their boasting then? Where did the arrogance go? If that happened to us, if we had our armies destroyed, our planes grounded, our, our battleships blown up at sea, we wouldn't be boasting either. We wouldn't be talking about being the greatest country in the world. No, because you can't boast when you're in that position. You don't want to paint such a target on your back. Now, it's normal to, bear, to brag in peacetime. It's not strange that Paul tells us to brag because we have peace with God. But what is strange is that we have peace with God in the first place. And that God tells us that this peace is going to last. That's what's really strange. He says in verse 10, while we were enemies of God, we were reconciled with God. He says we were God's enemies, and what it literally means is we were haters of God. We hated God. We wanted to do the exact opposite of what God wanted for us. And that's really just the natural state of man. If you look around us in America, you see this hatred of God everywhere. Everything God stands for, everything God says in the Bible, just pure hatred toward it, just plastered on the front pages of newspapers and on the internet. And that doesn't just go for unbelievers either. That deep-seated hatred of God is within us too. It's in our natural Adam, our old Adam that exists in each of us since conception. Our sinful nature is so bad that it would never want peace with God. 
our sinful nature is so bad that it would way rather us receive God's wrath and burn in hell than to try and find peace with God. Our sinful nature would have us shake our fist at God and say, I don't need you. I don't want to follow what you have to say. We'd rather face the consequences of that than have peace. Again, that's what our sinful nature wants. And so we see if brokering peace was left up to us, we would never have it. And that's what makes this whole thing very strange, especially when you think about it in a normal human perspective. Think about France in the early 1900s. Army destroyed, planes grounded, really no military, fight or military might left to speak of. The armies of Germany moving in to take over. Is Germany going to show up and sue for peace? Is Germany going to show up in the capital and ask France if they can have a peace treaty? No. That would be France who was looking for those things. Because when you're in power, you don't need peace with other people. It's when you've been defeated and destroyed and have no other options left. That's when you seek peace. That's not how it works with God. Paul says in verse 6, we were weak. Basically, we were helpless. We had no other options left. In this war between God and mankind, we had the all-powerful, almighty God coming. And then on the other side, we have us. Weak, helpless sinners who are dead in our sins and have no other options. Have nothing left we can possibly do. And here we are telling God, no, we don't want your peace. And so God did something to create peace with us, to stop the war between us and himself. He did something drastic. He dropped the bomb. But he didn't drop it on his enemies. No, he dropped it on his only son. He flattened him. He crushed him. He ensured that his only beloved son, Jesus, was the only casualty. And so we have peace through this sacrifice. God knew it was the only way. As verse 9 says, we're justified by Jesus' blood. Verse 10, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Yes, it needed to be through Jesus' death that we could have peace. And so God fulfilled this for us. And now, as verse 2 says, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Because of this peace that God has worked, we now can approach the Father. And no, we're not approaching an enemy, but we're approaching someone who looks at us in love. And as we stand before the Father, we stand forgiven, innocent of all our crimes and all of our sins. And so we can boast. We can brag. We can talk openly about this peace that we have with God because it was something that was done without our input. Yes, God made peace with you because he wanted peace with you. Now, it's one thing to brag about having peace. That's, that's really easy. That makes sense. But Paul tells us in verse 3 to rejoice in our sufferings. Really, boast. Because you're suffering, boast about it. Now, the world would say that's nonsense. Because if you have peace, you don't have suffering. If there's anything going on in your life that's bad, well, then you can't be at peace. That's what the world would say. And when we have suffering or tribulation in our lives, Satan is trying to convince us of the same exact thing. Satan's trying to convince us at these times that we're going through these difficulties because we don't have peace with God. Last week we read about Abraham and how God put him to a test to sacrifice his own son. And this past Wednesday night at church, 
We read about Peter and how the devil wanted to sift him like wheat. Every test we face, every suffering that comes up, at the same time, the devil's trying to use it to ruin our faith, and God is using it to try and build up our faith. And these tests, they come up every single day. As we fight against our own sinful flesh, that's a test. That's a suffering for us. As we exist in this, this sinful, dark world, that's a test too. That's a suffering. Sickness and death, these are sufferings that face us every single day. And when they come up, the devil is trying to convince you that you don't have peace with God. When these things come up, the devil is trying to convince you that you are the one person that God doesn't love, and so he's punishing you in this way. When you go through a trial, the devil is trying to convince you that you have dug yourself a pit so deep that the light of God's love can't possibly shine on you. That his sacrifice didn't actually pay for your sins. That you can't have peace, and you won't ever have it. That's what the devil tries to do through sufferings. But in each of these situations, in every test and trial, God shows us that the opposite is actually true. God uses these same tests to show us that there is no pit so deep that his love can't reach us there. That's what he's speaking of in verses 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Some really interesting words in there that point us to Christ. First of all, it says this suffering, it produces in us endurance. Uh, James uses that same word in his epistle when he's describing farmers. He says farmers have endurance when they plant their crops. Maybe you don't think of it that way, but basically a farmer, he plants his crops, he plants the seed, and he waits. If a week goes by and nothing starts popping out of the ground, he doesn't give up and plow under the field. No, he has endurance. He waits for it. If it doesn't rain for a week, he doesn't give up and burn the whole field down and say, we'll try again next year. No, he has endurance. He waits. See, through all of his experience, he's learned to know that the rain will come, that the growth will happen, and all he has to do is wait and trust in what he can't see. And that's what God's trying to do here. He gives us endurance to get through our trials and our suffering, to grab a hold of that promise that we have peace with God. And God uses this endurance, or uses this suffering to produce this spiritual endurance. And it says this endurance produces character. And that word character is kind of abstract, actually. Um, it basically carries this idea of something that is tested and proven, something that's tried and true. So, for instance, think of your favorite pillow that you like to sleep on at night. Once you get that favorite pillow, you don't go to the store and go buy a replacement. No, you need that pillow. When you go to a hotel and you get the lumpy, hard pillow at the Holiday Inn, you don't fall asleep very easily, and you yearn for your pillow. Your pillow is tried and true. You've tested it again and again and again, and you know that it's going to work for you. And Paul is not saying here that God makes us tried and true. He's not saying we have some indelible character in ourselves. He's pointing us to this promise of peace with God. Through all of our suffering, that remains tried and true. We can test it again and again and again. And the fact remains that we have the love of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that my sins are still forgiven, that I still have peace with God. And Satan, you have nothing on me. So no matter what pit we find ourselves in, no matter what suffering comes our way, we still have forgiveness with Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
we still have the hope that's being spoken of at the end of verse 4. Now, speaking about that pit, if you scan through the text and find any word that describes us in this text, it doesn't paint a very good picture. Here in verse 6, Paul says, we are weak. Later on, he says, we're ungodly. In verse 8, he calls us sinners, and that's like the worst kind of sinners is what he's talking about. And if that's not enough, verse 10 calls us God's enemies. So he says, you, you are weak, you're ungodly, you're sinners, you're God's enemies. Literally, he's describing the worst possible pit we can be in. The greatest stance in opposition to God that we could ever take. And then what does it say next? God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in this very condition, that is when God poured out his love on us through his own death. There's nothing left that we could do that could possibly make us more unforgivable, more irredeemable, more unlovable than the state that we were already in. And yet Christ washed us with his own blood. This shows us that nothing can separate us from the love of God which we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so it is right that God tells us to brag. It's good when we boast and when we talk about it openly, not in ourselves, but when we brag about our Savior, Jesus Christ. When we brag about a God who created peace with us, who didn't want it, we can brag in our sufferings because God sends them our way so that he can strengthen us so that he can give us a firmer conviction in the hope that we have. And this boasting, this bragging, we don't have to be concerned that it's going to come, come back in our faces. We don't have to be concerned that we're going to be wrong and embarrassed or that we were foolish to spend our time in God's word. No, because it's God's guarantee to you. Salvation was won through Jesus Christ, for each of you. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.